I wondered what effect you thought the pandemic would have on the entire crypto market, not just Bitcoin. I was really interested to see how um, traditional market participants would react in a moment like this. If you're running a hedge fund, there are two things that you're supposed to be doing, or one, one thing you're supposed to be doing and one thing that they do. The thing that they do is they typically run very levered because they're trying to take very, very small amounts of incremental risk. And the way that they do that is that they typically try to be hedged. You know, that's, that's why it's called the hedged fund, a hedge fund. And I thought in that, that they would look at Bitcoin and add it to their basket of instruments that they would use to run a hedged market strategy. And by and large, to be honest, that didn't happen. I think that there was some amount of activity, but the infrastructure of Bitcoin doesn't really allow market participants to step in at scale, you know, get massive turns of leverage, you know, use their prime broker, all the typical things that, you know, we do when we step into equity markets or bond markets. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, I can put you know, billions of dollars of credit default swaps on tomorrow. Um, and I can do that on, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of Notional. I have the infrastructure set up. I have the, you know, ISDA set up. I have all of this infrastructure that's made available to me as a market participant to be able to trade at scale or to take directional views at scale. Um, that's still a little bit haphazard. And so the uh, for, for, for market participants like that. So for hedge funds to step in, it's still hard. It's still too difficult. There's not enough uh, people. There's not enough liquidity. There's not enough leverage. There's not enough underwriting. There's not enough understanding by the traditional banks and the primes, prime brokers. Um, and so all of this stuff um, slows the natural um, progress of Bitcoin. Um, and so I was hoping that it would be a moment where out of a necessity, uh, people would go and figure these things out. Um, but Unfortunately, back to the earlier comment, what unfortunately happened instead was, you know, Bitcoin was basically, you know, tick for tick correlated with the S&P 500. And so, you know, you can't look at it as a hedge product. People who were long the S&P and had to sell, you know, couldn't look at Bitcoin and say, wow, that would have been better. They would have just gotten punched in the face twice as hard. Well, I was also curious. So do you see merit in any of the other crypto assets, uh, in particular Ethereum? No. And why not? It's kind of like when you have a bellwether instrument. The gains typically go to the winner. So I'll use an equity example to make the case. When Obamacare passed, there was going to be a clear tailwind to health insurance. And, you know, you could have bought a basket of health insurers or you could have just bought United Healthcare. The basket would have performed okay, United Healthcare 10x in the last 10 years. If you believed in smartphones, you could have bought a basket of things in 2010 when or 2008 uh, or nine, when the iPhone first got released, you could have bought, uh, you know, Nokia and Motorola and uh, Samsung and HTC, um, or you could have just bought Apple. And Apple, frankly, just crushed everybody else. The point is that in any market, when there is a clear winner, it's not that these other things can't win. But there's a weird psychological effect that almost drives these second and third tier winners, which is a desire by people almost out of this sense of insecurity to not want to admit that there's a winner simply because they weren't the one to pick it first. And so what they do is they create these convoluted narratives and theses to basically anoint other winners. And yeah, can they win? Sure. But do they ever win like the category killer? No. I mean, do you, do you really want to be long Lycos and DuckDuckGo, or did you just want to be long Google? Um, just there has been not a single market where you've been rewarded as handsomely um, for being long the number two, three, and four player as you are for being long the number one player. And again, it goes back to when things tip and go mass market, the average buyer makes the simple decision. And the simple decision is to go to the category defining winner and then set it and forget it. And so if you really want to make the money, um, my view has always been you find the one that's about to win, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, and you buy it. But what you don't do is try to do some convoluted spread trade or, you know, long the number two, three, four, five person, hope they, you know, it's just really honestly, just you can make a little bit of money, but there's so much brain damage and pressure and complication it's just never so, worth it. So you don't view, you essentially view all the crypto assets as kind of like 
one category. Like you don't break them out into separate categories because a lot of people would say like Bitcoin is a currency and Ethereum is, you know, this platform just for decentralized applications and they they don't view them necessarily as competitive. I mean, there are of course people who do view them as competitive, but a lot of people just see them as fundamentally different things. But you, know, you I'll give you a different example. Um you could look at Mercado Libre as an incredibly complicated, you know, and valuable uh, delivery platform for Central and South America. And you could look at Wayfair as uh, an unbelievable example of, uh, you know, uh, furniture uh, bought, purchased and designed over the internet. I look at it and I'm like Spanish Amazon and furniture Amazon. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I'll just be, I'll just buy Amazon. <laughs> I, you know, I honestly, Laura, this goes back to a philosophy of mine, which is, what I've learned over time is that, you know, I've really made my life much harder than it's needed to be, um, you know, and I've overcomplicated a lot of decision making in my life. And as I've gotten older, what I realize is that the best decisions are the ones that are really instinctive and the most simple. And uh, you can use enormous amounts of data um, and you can find all kinds of clever ways of slicing and dissecting things. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the simple decision tends to be the best and the most defensible and the most enduring decision. And one of the simplest decisions that you can make is to buy the category winner and wish that the whole category does well. Because if it does, as long as the category winner stays on top of the category, they will get the disproportionate amount of the gains. And that's just com been completely true in markets, you know, since uh, time immemorial. I also wanted to ask you, because in a way we already started to go there, in an interview with Jason Calacanis in 2017, after the ICO boom was uh, pretty well underway, you referred to ICOs as doing nonsense at the edges. And you said that people really needed to get back to core fundamental business principles. And you said things like hardworking people with pensions or people working at hospitals didn't need a cryptocurrency and a digital wallet. And you've probably heard about this investment thesis that many crypto funds have where they say that the services and products that are currently offered by tech giants could be fundamentally remade and offered as decentralized services that are offered over crypto networks. And the users could be user owners where they like own a piece of the network through the token. And they call this kind of like the Web3 investment thesis. So I wondered what you thought of it. Is, do you think this has merit or would you continue to call this nonsense at the edges? Because I didn't know when you said that if you just meant like the method of fundraising or if you meant like even this whole idea of user owner. No, I, think the, I think that idea has merit. Um, um, I think that the, the specific way in which it's framed, though, is over-intellectualized and over-complicated. Again, I think that, you know, the products that I've been involved in helping to build that have gotten to real massive scale, um, you know, Facebook, Slack, just being a couple of examples, AIM when I ran that business at AOL, um, Winamp before that, which was a predecessor to iTunes, all of these businesses I've helped kind of get over, you know, 100 million uh, users. And what I'll tell you in my experiences there, and in some obviously, you know, billions of users in the case of Facebook, um, simplicity in design, but also simplicity of ambition. And simplicity of ambition doesn't mean that you don't have a grandiose ambition, um, but it just allows you to frame and filter decisions in a more basic framework. And so then you don't get these, you know, convoluted product features or implementation paths, et cetera. You know, one thing to realize is that um, product development cycles on the internet also tend to move in a pendulum. And, uh, you know, like I said in the previous example of economic cycles, you know, the economic cycle, the pendulum is between labor and capital. In the internet, the, the product iteration pendulum is between um, highly, highly aggregated and highly, highly fragmented. And right now we're in a very aggregated part of the cycle. You have a few companies doing many and most things for consumers. Um, but it will break apart. It'll break apart because consumers get tired of the Swiss Army knife and they want um, more excellent, simple products for very specific use cases and companies come and fill that gap. Part of what will enable that is that the standards of product development are becoming more open and more standardized. And so, you know, apps speak nicely to each other. 
Um, and all of that enables a much more open collaborative uh, product process, which benefits consumers. 